I am Doug Friedman. And I am Meredith Levy. And this is us. <laughs> Your mental breakdown. The us edition. It's a little special edition for you guys. Yeah, this is insight in. <laughs> oh my God, that's funny. It is. It's insight right? in about us. We're going to, we're going to give you a little sneak peek inside of our brains and lives because why not? Yeah. Well, we've, we've taken a, a break for the last couple of weeks. We're in between season one and two, but the last couple of weeks we've just done nothing on here. Part of the reason is I've been moving. Meredith, you just moved a couple months ago. Yeah. That we talked about it on here. Moving, moving's a motherfucker. Oh man. It's gnarly. gnarly. Yeah. And it brings up a lot. We were talking about this, certainly it brought up a lot for me, which I'll explain in a minute, but it you know, got us thinking about part of the reason we have for doing the podcast in the first place and the timeline yeah. and yeah. kind of wanted to share with you a little bit of what that was, what that is, and you know, maybe what it will continue to be. Yep, probably. We'll just start with, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, when I moved... I had been in my place for 15 years. So it is no matter what the move is, I think whether you've been there for six months or 30 years, moving's just a lot, no matter what physically, mentally, you know, but then on top of it, whatever it brings up for you. And yeah. And for, for me, I've been in my house for four years and the first two of those years were with my wife, Kim, and it was our house that we found together and, and, the life that we were going to build and have together. And two years ago this month, uh, she passed away. So that her life ended, our life ended, and I needed eventually to not be in that house in order to to move forward. But the the grief that I've been through and continue to go through is still there coming up all over again now. And it, it made me think of our timeline because right around the time Kim died, your mom died. Uh, I think it was two, two weeks later, three weeks later. Yeah. I think it was like three weeks later. It really is one of the most horrible things. And at the mm. same time, it, it is what it is. Both are true. You and Kim originally had started recording a pod, the podcast or you had the idea or something, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. We, we actually had done a couple of like, uh, chemistry tests just to put ourselves on on tape and see how we sounded because we were just so freaking witty and and entertaining as of it course. was we were like no problem hit hit record we'll be great <laughs> and, and we weren't <laughs> like, like it, it takes some work in fact i have the recordings and, and listened back to it a while ago and it was it was pretty painful for a variety of reasons to listen to but we were yeah we'd been talking about trying to do the podcast in some fashion for a long time and in fact her last day, we were in the car and we listened to an Esther Perel podcast together. And it kind of hit me and I just went, well, wait a second. What if, what if I just did like a session, like a full session with right. a client, but not a one-off? What if we like follow the client and then, and then we'll break it down. And, then, and we got really excited about that. And it was, it was really kind of cool um, and tragic because she, she died that night. <sighs> Fuck man. And then eventually Doug called me up and said, well, I was going to do this with Kim and, you know, I've known you for so long and we get along so well and you're <laughs> the only person in the world. <laughs> I'm laughing because. <laughs> Is that not what My happened? sister said, oh my God, you should do it with Meredith. I went, no way. Actually, I think I said, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically. Right. And, uh, I mean, I was just, I was so upside down for a while, totally. you know, for, yeah. for a long while. And, uh, you know, I finally did reach out to you. I'd say we bonded, but we were already bonded, but with what we had gone right. through and I was sort of describing what I wanted to do. And you very much like me were like, yes, let's yeah. do it. Boom. I'm in, let's go. And we both kind of had that mentality, which I think we needed to have as part of where we were with our grief and with our process to focus on something yeah. and to do something, to be able to do it together from a similar place was very healing, I think. Oh, for sure. And, and it definitely was nice to be along the same path of what we love to do anyway. And knowing that like, mm. ideally we're doing this, it's entertaining, but also to help potentially help people 
I think mental health is something that we both are very passionate about. Let's give the full picture of that, which is <laughs> right in between Kim dying and your mom dying, I got diagnosed with MS, multiple sclerosis. And it was very much a shock. I've been an athlete all my life and in great physical health. And then, you know, over the course of a few months, just figuring out something's wrong with me, what's going on. And got the diagnosis the week that Kim passed. And two weeks later, your mom passed and your mom had MS as well. Yeah. My mom had MS my whole life and, you know, progressively got worse and worse. And Doug's known me through a lot of that. So I don't know if that's the irony or the fate or the shittiness of Doug. I mean, yeah, you're so young and a week after your wife dies and my mom didn't die of MS per se, but it definitely contributed to her demise. I don't know. That's a tragic word. Downward spiral, yeah. whatever it is. So yeah, it was one of those things where, I mean, losing my mom was horrible. And also at the same time, though, my heart was breaking for you with being so young and your wife dying and, and the MS died. I mean, that's just like, what else you got, God or whoever? <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> right. Yeah. Bring it on universe. What do you got for me? And then, you know, fast forward a year and we get the pandemic and both of us were just like, whatever. It really does put things. I mean, I've, I've always had a pretty, it's going to be okay. Whatever happens, happens attitude. But especially after my mom died, the truth is like, I mean, that's not okay. And it is okay. Right. It fucking sucks. And part of it in my mind is like, well, there's really not going to be anything worse now. So cool. <laughs> right. I mean, nothing will ever be as bad as that week of my life. And that's right. something I'm still, I mean, I've, I've processed the hell out of, I, I was going to two therapists, you know, I think twice a week for a while. Like I was just yeah. getting support anywhere I could. I, I went back to work and worked with clients because when I could be present for someone else, I was fine. I was sharp. I could do that. I can compartmentalize. And it's interesting when we were talking with Wyatt or I was talking with Wyatt, you I were listening, listening to Wyatt. He talked about compartmentalizing and therapy being a place where he can open up those compartments. And that's exactly what I did, you know, with my, my own therapists, plural, I was opening those compartments. When I was being a therapist, it was compartmentalized and I could be fully present and that it felt great. It was, is it avoidance? Sure. But it's avoidance knowing I'm avoiding yeah. something in order to. Right? Yeah. Well, I went to work the next day after my mom passed away you know, everyone's like, what are you wow. doing? I'm like, I have to, because it was, right. I was still so sad and just, yeah, in shock probably. But each hour I had with my client was an hour where I was engaged and present and not thinking. And it saved my life, literally. Right. Like I just, for, we all grieve differently, but for me, that's, that's what worked. And I feel like, I don't know, maybe it was a Thursday or something. So I, you know, I got the weekend. Great. I have all the time in the world to lay on the couch and cry. And I did. And that's fine. And again, like it's different for all of us, right. but my clients and my work and my colleagues and just is like what kept me sane and kept me going. Yeah. And, and I was very similar. I mean, when I had what I learned later was an MS attack. The first one I had was that summer and I was in the ICU and they didn't know what was wrong yeah. with me at the time. And, you know, Kim thought I was going to die and we had no idea. And I got out of the ICU and I recovered to a degree. And I looked it up a week later, I was seeing clients. Yeah. Right. And it was, that's what I do. That's what I needed yeah. to do. After, after Kim died, I was back in the office seeing clients in two weeks. Some people would go, Oh my God, how can you do that? Same thing you were hearing. And it was, right. I have to, because I, I need to get outside of myself and, and do something that's not about me and compartmentalize that so that I'll, still feel like I can function in the yeah. world. And then when I open up those compartments, then I could be a wreck on my own right. time. And I was, you know, and that's, you know, one of the things that I said early on in the podcast, double down, don't shut down. I think I fucking tripled down on this because I, I really walked right into the grief, you know, and the shock of, of everything that happened to me. Yeah. Actually, I was, now that I think back, I was in therapy at the time. It's weird though. It's just one of those things where it happened pretty quickly and then it wasn't quick and then it was quick. I, I talked about on a, a reflection recently, the difference between endurance and stamina, that endurance is being able to take on something and get through something. And stamina is your ability to do that over a prolonged period of time. 
we can endure something like a quarantine for when we thought it was two weeks, no problem. <laughs> but the stamina to do it for seven months, it's not sustainable. It, it's really, really hard. And I think for us with a lot of what we were going through and with grief in general, it's not an endurance thing. It might not even be a stamina thing. It's just recognizing, you know, the line I love for this is grief is not a line you cross. It's a road you take. And we were just taking that yeah. road and, and this is how we did it. I think it's also sort of a survival quote unquote instinct, if you will, you know, whatever mm. it takes to get through it. And I think at this point during the pandemic, there is a similarity. There is a huge amount of grief for people, not only for the people that they've lost, but just kids not being able to be in school, not being able to experience right. your first, you know, going to prom or going away to college or not being able to go to work or losing your business or whatever it is, you know, I think there's so much about, okay, so this is beyond our control and now what? Right. That's what I was keyed into with moving out of the house, out of my house, out of our house was being there. I was still surrounded by this lifestyle and this future yeah. that I was promised that isn't going to happen anymore. Yeah. Right. And that's a lot of how we've all been, I think, in the pandemic is there True. There was a level of life that we were used to, that we thought, you know, I have clients that were about to go to college, the pandemic hits and okay, they're supposed to be at a school right now and they can't yeah. be, you know, and even kids in daycare, like some can actually go to some daycares, but some are just at home in front of a screen. Yeah. So we went from being in schools surrounded by people to being at home staring at a screen. There's a lifestyle that I think we're all not just adjusting to, but grieving that we don't have anymore. Totally. I think for a lot of people, we compare ourselves to other people who we think it's their situations worse or, oh, I shouldn't complain. But the truth is right. it's all relative and we're all going through our own shit. So would I rather be in a pandemic than have my mom die? Sure. But that's not a choice I have. Right. And in the moment right. being in a pandemic, I mean, God, I remember the first week I was like, that's it. I can't do it. My life is over. I was crying. I was like, I can't not go to the office. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do? Right. It's almost eight months later. I'm like, God forbid, like I went to the grocery <laughs> store today and I just looked around and I was like, I wonder if we're ever not going to have to wear masks because that would just right. be great. Just that, right. just that little thing. Yeah. I mean, and, and even just shaking hands with people or hugging people, like that's not the norm anymore oh at God. all. It's, so crazy. it's wild. There's, there's a lifestyle we just don't have anymore. And that could we endure it? Sure. If it was finite and when we knew it was going to come back, but we don't. So do right. we have the stamina to endure something over that period of time? No. I mean, that's, and then again, we started talking about grief and, and the idea of, well, are you always going to be grieving? I don't know if I'll always actively be grieving, but I think grief will always be a part of my life. It's always right. going to be there. You know, you, yeah. <laughs> it can't unhappen and I can't unexperience that. I can have a better relationship towards it and a better understanding of it. Yeah. And I just keep getting tattoos, uh, in honor of my mom. So, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I think one of the other things that the, is highlighted by the pandemic for someone like you or my stepdad is that all of a sudden during the pandemic, you are totally fucking alone. Whereas right. a couple of years ago you would have been with her or he would have been with my mom. And it's just like magnified, like, Oh yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it, it does magnify it. And it's really tough because there's connections that we have and, and people in our lives, other family and friends, and it's wonderful. And it's not the same. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's similar to your mom. There's no one else is, is your mom. Yeah, definitely not. My sister and I were talking today about the election and how we fill out the, the ballot and how it, we always used to depend on our mom to tell us or help us with the local props, whatever. Right. Now we had to be big girls and do it ourselves this time. <laughs> of course, have our, have our stepdad help us a little bit. Yeah, it's just crazy. So the things that you notice along the way and grief is just part of life and it sucks. Yeah, it, it does. And it, it's something that, again, will always be there, but your relationship toward it will, will change. I, I talked about it, I think, on the podcast when I talked about my dogs. 
talked about yeah. my, my dog, Franklin, that I had for 13 years, you know, loved him. He was amazing. And after he passed, you know, all of my friends like, wow, are you, I, I mean, you have, well, what do you do after that? You can't just yeah. get another dog. I'm like, nope, I'm done. Like, no way. I'm done. There'll never be another Franklin. And what happened? And then Beckett came along and Ugh. looking at that guy and, you know, rescued him from a shelter. And he's phenomenal. He's amazing. Such a great love. And so different than Franklin. He's not a Franklin replacement. He's not Franklin no, too. No, exactly. You know, he's he's very different. I mean, it, it's amazing to me that Franklin was the guy that would spend the guy, the dog. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? That would spend a weekend, you know, in the mountains camping with me. You know, we'd hike five miles in, disappear from everybody. And it was great. Great. I can't do that with Beckett. Like physically, I don't think I can do that anymore. Well, also his and, legs are so little. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, he would do it. He would do it. And it, it, it made me sad. And then I think it was my sister who said, right, but you never got to go to a restaurant or to Whole Foods and go to the market with Franklin. And you do that with Beckett. Right. Like, right, right. Different. Totally. Just different. Yeah. And I, I love Beckett so much. And I love Franklin so much. It doesn't diminish my love of one or the other to have that relationship with each of them. Yeah. And I think finding the tiny positives or big positives or silver linings with, okay, well, you know what? We wouldn't be doing this if together, if Kim hadn't passed away again, I'd rather her right. still be alive than right. be doing this, but trying to find something that has come out of it. Yeah. And there's, I remember listening to, uh, I think it was a Ted talk. Um, and I heard an interview with this woman, Nora McInerney. She was talking about her podcast and the story of, of her, you know, developing it and doing it. One of the best names for a podcast, other than ours, of course, of that course. I heard. Terrible Thanks for Asking. And her story <laughs> so was good. With, right? within a couple of weeks in the same hospital, her husband passed away, her father passed away, and she had a mi miscarriage. Oh, my God. So that all happened within the span of, I think, a week or two in the same hospital, just different floors. And she had to walk through all that. And that's amazing. It's huge. And again, terrible. Thanks for asking. Oh my God. So, Great and name. that's what I would actually, I forgot about that. Sorry. But hmm. two weeks after my mom passed away, my stepdad had a heart attack and you know, oh, wow. I'm, I'm so we're as close as can be. And I was like, what the fuck? And you know, of course he's like, mm. I just drove myself to the hospital. I was like, okay, that's great. Same hospital right. where my mom passed away. And literally yeah. he didn't have heart problems. And every nurse and doctor that had taken care of my mom were like, this is literally a broken heart. Like we see this right. when it, when this happens, when people have been together so long. And I was like, fuck, no, you are not going anywhere. Get back here. Right. And I think, you know, and people would ask me, how are you doing? I mean, not the average Starbucks person, but people would ask me and I'd be like, um, <laughs> right. yeah, my mom died. And they were like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And I would say it's so fucked. It's horrible. And don't worry, there's nothing to say. So you don't right. like, right. I would really put that up because there is nothing. You are not going to say anything to make me feel better. I promise you that. There's books written about what to say to somebody yeah. grieving or somebody who's lost somebody because it's, it's really awkward. Yeah. It is. I've, I've noticed all the people coming around, not knowing what to say and wanting to be there. And certainly in the very beginning, yeah. there was an influx of people and people that were Kim's friends that I didn't know, yeah. you know, and it was amazing how many people wanted to express something. And I was just so upside down. And at the time, <laughs> most of them had no idea what was going on with me also getting diagnosed with MS. Yeah. Right. You know, they just knew about my wife. You know, you kind of want to let other people off the hook. Or you want to tell them to fuck off. Totally. <laughs> exactly. So for anyone out there who doesn't know what to say, it doesn't matter really what you say. I mean, it does, but it doesn't because no matter what, they're going to have their feelings and either one in a million comments will make you feel better. They're not going to make you feel worse, hopefully. Right. <laughs> like it's nice hopefully. to- you never know. It's nice to know people care. That is for damn sure. We appreciated yeah. everybody that reached out and it was really nice to know that people cared. Yeah. And I'll, I'll name somebody in particular. A lot of my friends are therapists, not all of them, but many. Yeah. And a therapist that was on her first round, round table, John Sovek lives, you know, five minutes away from, from our house. And he said, Hey Doug, listen, 
I, I'm just calling to see how you're doing. You don't have to tell me, but I'm going to call and I'm going to check up on you every couple of weeks. Mm. And if there's anything you need, or if you want to take a, a walk with Beckett, I will come over. We'll walk. If you want to so talk, sweet. we'll talk. Yeah. But I'm just going to keep calling to check in. Yeah. And it was, you know, that was great. Yeah. You know, from somebody that I know well, you know, if somebody yeah. I didn't know well said that, I'd be like, dude, stop fucking calling me. <laughs> <laughs> Stalker. <laughs> It's very interesting when somebody's going through grief that it's not just the person affected by it, it's everyone around too, because they don't know how to act around somebody that's grieving. Yeah. Right? Totally. And and it really, a lot of people said, my parents are getting older. It makes me realize like, you know, my really close friends were like, shit, I'm envisioning now, like what would happen if my mom died or how, you know? And so I think it does that. It people that are close to you, for you, oh my God, what would I do if my wife died or anything's possible? Or right. And it it did bring up this thing in me, this very life is short. I mean, I knew that I have that sort of approach to life anyway, but it made me realize it much more with my relationships with people, not like, oh, I should go skydiving, but just like, right. you know what, maybe you should stop flaking on your friends or <laughs> maybe you should reach right. out right. to family <laughs> somewhere. And really lean into what's important to you. And it's, yeah. and I think a lot of people are feeling that with pandemic, it's who's in your pod, you know, or, or who do you prioritize? How do you prioritize your time and, and who you spend it with? I think that's, that's huge because the reality is could all end tomorrow Yeah. for somebody, for us, we have no idea. So how do yeah. you want to spend today? And it's yeah. not carte blanche to do whatever you want today. Of course. It's just going, right. Remember to reach out to the people that you're connected with, that you love, yeah. tell them that and, and feel that and be that. And did make me definitely, I mean, it was one of the things I was like, yeah, all right, fuck it. I'm selling my place. I've been here for 15 years. It's time to move mm -hmm. on. And I think for you, that's something else that's coming up is now that you are moving on all the memories and all this stuff and all the unknown and uncertainty and yeah, Doug's just, uh, he sold his place and he's going to take a backpack and wander around the world. <laughs> <laughs> close, close. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not getting a new place yet. I'm, I'm going to, I am going to go to Colorado and be in the mountains for a few months and just kind of, you know, maybe write the book, maybe, you know, just let it sink in, play some guitar and, and just heal and be. And yeah. pandemic is a perfect time to do that. I mean, it's, it's a shitty time. You know, certainly, but it, it's it's a time to really recognize. At least for us, we can do our work remote. I mean, we're we're in a sense lucky to be working. Absolutely, but being able to do that remotely means we could do it anywhere. Yeah, and for me, certainly not having a house anymore means oh, I literally can do it anywhere, and I <laughs> have to do it anywhere but my old house. Yeah, and my stuff is already in storage. I've got just what I'm going to take with me, and it's it's bizarre, man. Such a, a untethered feeling, which can be really liberating and can be really anxiety producing and scary. It's, it's all of them. Yeah. I hope you hate it there. So you don't stay. Just <laughs> kidding. and Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to go visit Doug. You never know. I mean, I, I honestly, Mary, I, I don't know. Does, does this happen? Do we stay remote for like the next year or are we back in a couple of months? We have no idea. Like I you know. were just saying a little while ago, are we going to have to wear masks every time we go out? Like, is that, is that just what we do now? It's wild. Yeah. It just makes it weird. I saw a really cute guy at the grocery store today, but I wasn't sure if he was cute. Because <laughs> he was wearing a mask? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that reminds me of those, you remember those cartoons where like it, it would be this, this beautiful woman with a veil on yes. and she would just look wonderful and then they yes. pull the veil off and she's got like wild teeth and just a wild, yeah. not that there's anything wrong with wild teeth. No. I, I loved, you know, the singer Jewel with her teeth. I'm like, yeah, don't ever get that oh, fixed. Yeah. That looks cool. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to be like and, and when we're going to settle and if we ever settle. And it's, it's funny, a good friend of mine said early on in the pandemic, she was very close with Kim and said, I feel like the rest of the world is catching up to where we've been for the last year and a half. So true. Yeah. Right. I think a lot of people feel like that, that struggle with depression and anxiety and talked about that before that just knowing what it's like for everyone else to sort of feel the way that they've been feeling maybe for their entire lives. Right. Just lonely or down or bored or scared to leave the house or whatever it is, you know, it makes them feel a little bit more understood. Yeah. I mean, there's something to this where 
it, it's a collective grief that we're all going through. And if we can lean into that and support each other through that, you know, which is something I think is great about not necessarily our podcast, but the community around it is totally. these are people that are bonded over this and going through this and supporting each other. I think that's super important because a lot of people, you know, have really good friends and family, but they don't necessarily understand what they're going through, whether it's anxiety or depression or, or mental yeah. health issues or not. But with this, we're all going through, I think, this this collective grief, unless you're ignorant to it or choosing to disbelieve it. Sure. We're just <laughs> setting those aside. Not No judgment, maybe a little, but no judgment. Maybe a little. Maybe a little. Maybe a little. But yeah, I did have that thought the other a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but it was so weird. It just struck me out of nowhere that pretty much every single person in the world probably for the first time ever, is literally experiencing the same thing at the same time. Right. I mean, literally everywhere in the world, whatever it is, yeah. they're aware of this thing and it is affecting them one way or the other. Right. Start with masks. Just that. Just the... At some time in this pandemic, I feel like everybody's worn a mask at least once. So it's just so strange to think that way. Well, and some countries are doing it a lot differently. Like I have... I've, friends in Australia and they talk about, you know, what's going on there. And there, there's a really strict two week travel quarantine. Yeah. Where if you come back yeah. from anywhere, you have to go like from the airport to a hotel for two weeks. It's wild. Yeah. But then again, that's kind of how you, you do it and isolate, you know, from this. And it's, I don't know that there's, there's a level of, we never really get political on here. And I'm trying to say this not politically, but okay, I think good. there's a level of <laughs> arrogance that Americans have overall. Oh, we're we're the most egocentric country in the fucking world. And I say we're the that best. <laughs> we are the best. No, I it's funny when I lived in Spain for a year and I realized when I was there, I at some point I had a couple Swedish roommates and everybody but me, and I do mean that, everybody that I was with on a regular basis knew so much globally, they could name the prince or the prime minister or the king or the president right. of um, t lots of countries and lots of, and I was just like, uh, I know my country. <laughs> right. Right. So, I mean, that is what it is. Yeah. You could often tell the Americans around people were like, are you oh, German? Yeah. I was like, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny when, when I traveled to the Middle East many years ago, I think that was in maybe, uh, Oh five. We were told, my girlfriend at the time, we, we went out there and we were told, tell everybody you're Canadian and don't say you're American. Like, yep. why? Why not? You know? And I think there were one of the Bushes was president at the time. And we met a couple of people. This is really cool. We were, we were in the, this area outside of Jordan looking at an old Roman like castle, which is like uh, the ruins of some Roman wow. emperor that had like this, this huge summer grounds. And it was amazing. Like the most amazing part was we could walk all over it and touch anything as opposed to like the museums where you can't touch anything at all. Yeah. Yeah. We literally like, wow, we're like wandering through this castle and wound up like in this weird dungeon room and we're using our iPhone lights to try to see the way. Oh my and God. We, that's so cool. We go up on like a little turret and we're, we're up at the top of this thing. We meet a couple of guys um, who are native in, in Jordan and we just started talking. And one of them spoke English decently. And, uh, you know, when they asked where we were from, we felt safe enough and we said America. And, you know, they asked if we, if we liked our president, if we liked Bush. And we said, no, one of the things that we like about, you know, being American is we can say that we don't yeah. like our president and yeah. that's okay. Yeah, true. And it became a really productive talk. And we were actually proud to be American in that sense. And to be yeah. talking to these people representing that was really kind of cool. Remember travel? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. We were talking today, my sister and I about, oh, travel. Should we make plans for summer, spring? Maybe, maybe not. Come see me in Colorado. I know I'm going to. Doug and I can literally just talk forever. Anytime before we actually record, we just like zoom and talk <laughs> for so long that it takes us five hours to record anything. So you're hearing right. that happen now. We're just now talking about traveling to Jordan. Yeah, that's uh, that's funny. My mom just asked me if I remembered the book, My Travels with Charlie by John Steinbeck, which I don't remember reading. 
it might have been assigned to us in school, uh-huh. but I I don't I keep saying it. I'm not well read. I just remember little bits. But there was a book I think Steinbeck wrote about hitting the road with his dog. I don't know if it was him and his dog or a character and the character's dog, yeah. but like that's cool. That's that's kind of right where I'm at or about to be at, like hitting the road with my dog and being on a mountain somewhere. Right? Right. Wait. Yes. And also I just looked up when you said book. I'm actually getting up to grab this book. Hold on. <laughs> uh-oh. Uh-oh. Not a book. Are there pictures in it? Is it a pop-up? God, I used to love yeah. pop-up books. It's, oh my God, it okay. kind of is. I'm back. It's a kid's book. That looks like my speed. I could read that. It's a Yiddish kid's book that a client was telling me about the other day. And it's called It Could Always Be Worse. But it talks about, it's so amazing because it talks about this rabbi or this, I don't know, but this old man with a big family and all these animals. And he went to the rabbi and just said, oh my God, like, what am I, I don't know what to do. This is crazy. There's so many kids and animals and the rabbis, I think I could be getting this wrong, but whoever said, well, bring all your (laughs) cows inside and bring all your chickens inside, bring everything inside. And it became so chaotic and crazy. And then eventually the rabbi was like, okay, well, like bring them all outside. And eventually he brought them all outside. And then he's like, oh God, thanks. My life is so great and peaceful now. And, uh, Hmm. you guys get it. Do you get it? Do you get it? He just went back (laughs) to the same life. And, but the truth is, yeah, I guess it could always be worse. Right. Yeah. There's a joke I will butcher. This guy goes on vacation to some remote fishing town and, uh, the guy that runs the place, you know, fishes and cleans and cooks the fish and serves it for dinner at the place. And it's like, tastes so good. And the guy there is like, oh my God, I'm a businessman and I, I tasting your fish. It's amazing. Like you can turn this into a business. Like we can make this a thing and you can market this and you can make a lot of money and it could be huge. And everybody would like come for miles and, and you'd love it. And we can open up franchises and you could be all over the place and make a ton of money and then retire someday and go have a life somewhere in a small remote fishing village. <laughs> <laughs> right minus the fish that's that's kind of and minus the retiring that's that's where i'm going right now um well, we're in a couple of weeks but we will still well, be doing this while i'm there we will in fact season two will probably kick off while i am in colorado and you are here and we are listening to, it's wild i haven't heard any of the sessions that we're going to be doing since they probably happened really yeah and, and that's the thing about this podcast that i think is so great is that people are hearing Drew's sessions, they heard his first six months and now they're going to hear from that point, you know, forward. Yeah. And I don't remember that. It's been a while since he and I had whatever that session is. So it's going to be like a surprise for all of us. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So we're glad we got to give you a little insight into our lives and a little understanding of, of why we've been a little lax lately is there's been a lot going on. There's almost always a lot going on. There is, especially, yep. We have an interesting few weeks coming up. I'll say that. Oh man. (laughs) We'll just leave it there. Leave it there. We, we, we don't get political on here. No, we don't. Do we? No, No, no. Could we? No. Should we? (laughs) No, no. To each their own, to each their own. That's right. Well, no judgment we can have a stance and not say that the other stance is wrong. Just we favor nah, one or the other. We'll just leave it. No. We'll just leave it. Yeah. I like our neutrality because right. we're not neutral on anything else. Yes, we are. Oh. <laughs> 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 so yeah, you guys. Thanks for listening to us. Thanks for supporting us. As we said, it's been a very healing process for us to go through this yeah. with all you guys. And it, it means a lot to us that you guys are out there supporting us and and with, uh, with us for the ride. We appreciate you. And we will uh, talk to you, if not next week, very, very soon. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye.